welcome everyone. Um, Melissa's run off to grab something, but we'll just kind of, you know, give it a couple minutes while people come in and we get Melissa again. I hope you guys are all doing well and welcome to Collection Spotlight, our eighth episode. Amazing. Yay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, and here she is. Perfect. Great. Totally on time. Yeah. So as America was saying, welcome to Collection Spotlight. Um, yeah, our eighth episode. It's pretty amazing. We're going strong. We're really excited to be back in action after a tiny hiatus. So I'm Bess Murphy. I'm the curator at the Co Center for the Arts here in Santa Fe. And I'm here today on site at the Co Center with works of art from our collection that have been selected by our guest artist today. Um, I am really excited to share with you the pieces. I will serve sort of as the holder and presenter of the pieces, so you'll see me handling the objects. I usually like to note that I don't handle the objects in our collection with gloves. We use um, a hands-on uh, approach to our pieces, so my hands are thoroughly washed and dried, as always, but we like to have that more direct tactile interaction with our pieces. We feel like it's safer and more respectful, so that's our general approach at the Co. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to America to introduce herself. Hi, I'm America, and I will now pin myself. Hi, so I am the executive, um, what am I? I am a little flustered. I'm the publishing editor of First American Art Magazine, a co-host of Collection Spotlight Today. And um, Rachel can talk briefly about the Co. Um, the First American Art Magazine is a quarterly print and digital magazine, and we try to cover everything. We try to cover the entire hemisphere as much as we possibly can. But um, Rachel, do you want to briefly speak about the Co? Sure, I'll be very brief here because you're not here to listen to me, right? <laughs> so um, I'm a president and executive director at the Coast Center. Welcome everyone. And I want to thank America, Melissa, and Bess for putting this together, this terrific program. Uh, and um, our mission at the Co is about connection and learning through indigenous arts. And uh, we're dedicated to increasing public awareness, education, and appreciation of indigenous arts through our programs, exhibitions, and individual studies. Study. Of course, COVID has created um, a challenge for us, like with many nonprofits and arts institutions, but we're making do and we're really excited about the future. So I will turn you back to, I guess, Bess, Melissa, and America, but um, if you want to know more, go to our website. So that's coartscenter.org, and there you go. Sorry, totally butchered that. But um, I'm so happy to welcome um, Melissa Shaganoff today, who is a curator and also an artist. So I think that dual perspective is incredibly important. Um, she's Atna Athabaskan in Northern Paiute. She's an artist, activist, and curator, currently working at the Alaskan Pacific University's art galleries up in Anchorage, Alaska. Her work is shaped by structure and processes of the Dene Potlatch, which she's going to discuss with us today. Um, in 2021, Melissa will participate in two international residencies in Canada and in Sweden to explore conversation as an artistic practice. So I'm really happy and looking forward to visiting with you. But thank you, Melissa, for joining us today. Shannon, Shannon America and Bess and Rachel. Um, should I introduce myself? Well, you can pronounce the names of your clients, and I can't. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, so, Willie Jan and Sarot Da, Melissa Shagnos is at the land, you dish you with Quaker at land. I eat in the Anna Kayak since Yadin, artist at Curator Gogeshna, Chananako Tan was at North Land. It's good to see everyone here today. I see a lot of familiar faces and colleagues, uh, and well, the names of them. And uh, yeah, so. You know, thank you for being here. Chenan Quotent was at Northland. My name is Melissa Shaganoff. I'm caribou and fish eater clan from Night Dinyana, or the log over the river or Chickaloon village. Uh, and as America said, I'm a, a curator and an artist. And uh, I do a lot of work that explores those sort of intersections um, and, and really kind of um, trying to give power to primary source information, you know, elders, makers, uh, and sort of flip the script on on what we consider authoritative knowledge, you know, which is uh, something I'm really interested in and uh, very um, 
you know, privileged in the experience I, I, I've had. I, I got to know the co-center when I was a student at the Institute of American Indian Arts. And uh, Bess and Bruce and Rachel invited me to just come and hang out <laughs> every week, <laughs> which I did and uh, got to know the collection a little bit and uh, was really surprised at sort of the breadth of Alaskan sort of materials that are in the co. And um, I don't know, it, it felt made me feel closer to home uh, when I was in the desert <laughs> and feeling very far away. So yeah, I consider the co a really important part of uh, why I do what I do, which is you know trying to work uh, within institutions and museums um, in a way that is giving agency and you know bringing people to to the the real human information you know of current makers and elders and uh, trying to frame that in in the Diné potlatch, which uh, I'll talk a little bit more as we go through some of the objects today. But uh, yeah, so thank you for having me. <laughs> so Melissa, do you want to tell us which piece you'd like to start off the conversation with today? Yeah, um, let's go ahead and start with, uh, how about the, the quill work? Since okay. we just that. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So maybe I'll go chronologically and I'll hold up the earlier piece first, if that works for you. So you can see I have all of the pieces that Melissa chose sort of laid out on our table, but I'm gonna bring over this belt. So you all can get an up close view and uh, not have to look at my face so much. <laughs> so let me zoom out for a second. And then Melissa, I'm gonna zoom in so that you can see the quill work pretty up close. So these pieces were something that as a, as a young person, as a young student going into um, the collection, I was really excited to see. Uh, quill loom work, which is what this is, isn't something that's really practiced, at least not in my area today. Um, it's been something that I've been learning and learning about, you know, um, so it comes from Porky Pine, which is uh, Nuni in my language. And, uh, you know, the Porky Pine is, is something that's really important, you know, to um, Diné people, to Atna people, and uh, Diné people across the Arctic and North. Um, you know, it was, it was our beads prior to contact, you know, it was the way we really do decorations and, you know, create beautiful regalia. Um, I have like a little, a little noonie right here, a little, a little quill right there. And uh, so these would, this would be done um, with flattening. So you would flatten the quill in your teeth and then you would put it onto the loom. And you can see that as Bess is holding up each like little kind of pixel, I, I don't, I'm not sure if that's what you would call it, but each little square, little rectangle square of the quill work is a single quill. Um, Bess, do you think you could show the education resource? Yeah, the, yeah. The, so I think this just kind of shows you just sort of like how intricate each piece is because each little pixel is a single quill. Each pill, each piece. So this would be stretched on, you know, a piece of, of willow branch, you know, to create this loom and then held between your legs as you would sort of like loom it onto, onto the warp and weft of, of different thread, most likely sinew um, prior to contact. And then each quill will be dyed with different things, you know, mostly with berries, um, but also with ochre. Uh, I have a little piece of red ochre here that we get. Um, my my village, Night Dinyana, the log over the river, is is downwind of the um, the, the big glacier, the big uh, Madanuska glacier, and uh, along the riverbed you can find pieces of ochre that are just like crumbly like this, and you can um, add them to you know different sort of, you can add them to spit to blood, you know we call it tsetse, right here for the the ochre rock. Um, and it, it means it, it means it looks like blood and it's like a it's that iron oxide in the rock uh, 
Yeah, so I really like these pieces. I think they're, you know, just amazing and beautiful and just kind of shows really the innovation um, and you know, engineering of indigenous people, you know, um, everywhere, but, you know, of the Atna people and the Diné people. You know, they're just really intricate, beautiful pieces. So this one's- How heavy is that? Like, this one's really- that? It's not heavy, really, necessarily. In particular, I don't think the quill work isn't heavy. You know, it has um, backing on it. It's moosehide, I think. So that's that's probably the heavier part of this piece. Um, and this one's a more contemporary one. You know, it's sort of hard to tell. The porcupine quills are, you know, they're del they're delicious. <laughs> so they show their age sometimes. Um, so these these look older, perhaps, than they are. So this piece, we actually know who made it. So it's from, um, let's see, never remember anything when I'm on the spot. But so Madeline Saya made it. And it's from the late 1980s. And so Ted Co collected this actually when he was, he took a lot of trips up to Alaska, driving all the way from Santa Fe up to Alaska. So this was purchased on one of his trips up north. So. Yeah, and this one you can obviously tell is, is a bit is a is a more contemporary piece because it has the beading along the edges, you know, which is you know pretty uh, standard for, um, you know, pr for for more contemporary pieces that sort of triangle edge beading, mm -hmm. and it's definitely moose hide. It's much thicker, you know. You can kind of tell, and the color as well. Um, you'd use with punk wood with a uh, rotten wood mm -hmm. to smoke. But yeah, I also probably should qualify. My knowledge is really just knowledge imparted to me by my aunties. It's not really from any sort of anthropology study or, you know, anything like that. But um, uh, yeah. That's why we're talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> Auntie knowledge is good knowledge, Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> So that's these two pieces. And, you know, Melissa mentioned that the uh, loom was an educational piece. And I was just saying that it's strange. So the database predates the work that we do now. And so it was listed as an educational piece. So we don't have very much information on it. But I think it's such a valuable work in progress and showing process that it is, I think it's moved out of its status and now is fully embraced as a piece, an active piece in the collection. So, and I love this. I'm so glad that um, I remembered to bring it down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think I saw that when I was at the Co before because yeah. it, so there's actually a, um, a resource that uh, that I'll try to drop in the chat later, but um, it's uh, the Arctic Study Center um, in, in Anchorage, the Smithsonian Arctic Study Center. They did a whole um, unit on, uh, on quill work. And so they brought someone down to kind of from, or brought someone up from the States to, uh, to, to teach this sort of like lost art to many quill artists. Um, Emma Hildebrand and uh, it's escaping me the other artist, but they did a whole sort of um, resource that's available online. It's created by uh, Don Bittison at the, uh, it's housed in the Anchorage Museum, but the Arctic Study Center is a separate office of the, of the Smithsonian. So if you look at their YouTube channel, you can find um, all that information. Thanks. So where do you want to go next? How about let's look at the um, the moose the moose hair the moose tufting. Moose hair. Yay! Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yay! So this is a, a wool bag, um, and the floral sort of elements are created with uh, moose beards. Um, as as I grew up learning how to uh, dye and tuft with with moose moose hair, so um, you would take their beards, and uh, it was a a part of the hair that was much easier to dye. Um, Mostly growing up, we would do moose hair tufting, but I've also done caribou hair tufting. And uh, you don't want to like probably run your hands through. So I actually wore this like little, this was one of my first pieces that I created or one of the second ones where you can see that it's, it's all individual hairs in the tuft. 
right here. And uh, yeah, this is this is a really kind of uh, special, important, and I, and I would say a more contemporary style of Diné sort of uh, regalia. Uh, it's you know used on dresses, used on belts, used on bags. Um, but the floor elements, I think, were a bit more uh, inter that were introduced more with uh, Russian and trade and um, basically the kind of like a contact, you know, floral floral beadwork patterns, moose hair bat patterns, at least in my region, didn't really get there until later. It was mostly porcupine quill um, geometric designs and dentalia canconet designs. So. Yeah, but uh, but these are this is this is really special, you know, um, given its age and uh, yeah. But it's it when done right, it can last a really long time. Yeah, this is one of my favorite pieces in the collection. So I was really excited that you chose it because uh, I love how it merges tufting, which is such um, an amazing and delicate art, but is also super fashionable. Like it's a really stylish, great piece that I would love to carry around, right, as a bag. So cool. I saw it and I thought of you because I, re I remember you telling me that because I because you were because I was like, oh, is that is that a caribou hair, you know, or moose hair? Because we would do moose hair because we got we would get moose mostly in our area. But if we'd go up the road, you could get caribou. And I remember my aunties doing caribou hair tufting and watching them. But we had only done moose hair you know, which is like, it's right here, right here on its beard. And I, I don't really know why I actually saw someone, another artist in this group who might be able to talk about that, um, uh, tufter themselves, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a different kind of um, protein in the hair along their mouth. And so mm. it's easier to dye. Hmm. Is there a difference when you're working with it between the texture of moose hair versus caribou hair? Uh, I think caribou hair is a bit finer, is mm. what I would say. Yeah, moose hair. Between caribou and moose, their hides, moose are larger animals. They have tougher hides, thicker hair, you know, whereas caribou uh, are a bit smaller. You know, uh, caribou are, are like kind of like reindeer, you know, um, to people who are not from north. You know, so they're they're much smaller, although reindeer are smaller than caribou, but uh, they also have thinner hides and uh, softer softer fur. Hair, I guess, not fur. Cool. Trying to get the color is really not showing through on this, so just so yeah, that you all know, know. yeah, it's, yeah, it's showing really badly, but it's like light yellow, blue, green, and pink, which. I mean, we have an older photograph in our database. The dyes have faded even since that photograph was taken. So, yeah. um, well, and you can see, you know, so they're they're pom poms, right? So, so basically, the hair is tacked down, and then on the other side, it's tied with a special kind of knot to make it so it it will puff up. And then you go through with scissors and you you shape it. So. But it's very, it, it gets everywhere. Like you'll have caribou or moose hair everywhere for days. In your coffee and everything, it's in the air. It just like flies everywhere. But it's, but it's like you're a little barber <laughs> is what my auntie used to say. And she'd say you cut all around it. Like you're cutting around somebody's head. <laughs> very cool. Yeah, like little snowballs. <laughs> Cool. Oh, America, I think you're on mute. Which is still a good thing. But yeah, the colors are coming through nicely here. Are they? Oh, good. OK, I good. The, the yeah, subtleness and the, the black <laughs> wool just really makes it pop so well. Yeah, I know. I always feel like that bag is probably, it's not, we, we think it's probably from the early 90s. But to me, it seems very 70s in a really wonderful way. Maybe it's just the orange beads. <laughs> I would uh, suggest everyone look at uh, Emma Hildebrand. I, I, I'd say she, in my area, she's the best tufter to find, Emma Hildebrand. She actually just got a Rasmussen um, Artist Award. She's very, uh, very talented. Nice. Excellent. So what do you think next? Let's look at the quiver. OK. Thank you, America. No worries. 
I'm going to zoom out and then slowly zoom in. <laughs> So this piece um, is, I can, you know, feels very special to me. Uh, so, um, you know, I'm a Degrea Kakista. I, you know, reside and live on Denina lands, um, you know, in Anchorage. Uh, but I grew up in uh, Katnu Ista. I grew up, I, which, which translates to I sit in. So I, I grew up in, um, in Kenai. And Kenai is also Denina territory. And uh, in the record of this, it's T-A-N-I-N-A, uh, uh, -A, but actually it's Denaina or Denaina, as my dialect would say. And uh, this is very similar to many of the quivers that have been found on the Kenai um, with the caribou uh, red ochre there. Um, you see these little pictographs, you know, that were um, amongst Diné people um, and on the peninsula, you know, so the southern coast, the central southern coast of Alaska is where I grew up. And uh, this is very, very um, similar to the different quivers I've seen and are kind of like very, uh, very important and I would say kind of, kind of look towards as Dinaina or Danaina, um, I don't know what the right word is, but these quivers and pictographs have become part of sort of modern culture, you know, have become sort of part of like every part of the Kanaitsis tribe's um, aesthetic, you know, that these pictographs are something that's very special and there's lots of stories about them. So seeing this here was was really, really cool. And I remember talking to Bess about this piece because it, it looks like it maybe got singed or a little bit at the quiver like part, the really the pointy part. And we were saying like, it looks like a, an object that was used, that was really utilized and then maybe just sold because it was, because it was ripped or singed or burnt. Um, that stitching is incredible. The zigzag stitching. Yeah, it's really, it's really, really special. And uh, so that red, that red paint is um, tissue, you know, or to say, so this is that, that um, paint. Uh, red ochre is a really Can important. You show that again? Yeah, so it's just a little rock. Yeah, same thing, okay. Yeah, so in the mountains, you'll find this in more of like a clay form. Um, but here in, in Kenai, it would be something that would wash up. It would wash up on the shores, you know, and uh, would be used to, to mix the paint. And you'd mix it with blood or you'd mix it with water or, yeah. And then you would create this, you know, this really beautiful piece. Um, you know, that has these uh, caribous depicted on caribou um, skin. And you can tell it's caribou skin because it's much thinner than moose hide. Um, and caribou, there's still, uh, there's still a small herd on the peninsula where the Dena'ina people are, where I grew up. I was just down there a couple weekends ago and, you know, ran into them. They're just walking around. <laughs> they kind of walk around on sidewalks <laughs> in Kenai. Kenai is a pretty rural um, place. It's a very rural town. But uh, yeah, this piece was really special. And when you say pictographs, so there's a uh, rock art with um, similar imagery? No, not really rock art. You would just see this kind of on quivers is what I've seen. Okay. Yeah, but... Um, there's actually a really good book. Oh, I don't have it over here, but uh, that the the Anchorage Museum did an exhibition that um, the uh, Dinaina, actually Susie Jones is in the is in the <laughs> in the meeting. She probably could talk about it. She curated it, but um, they this quiver is a very one that's very similar that was featured in that exhibit, uh, and the sort of red ochre is is very special. Melissa, the triangles down at the bottom here. Mm -hmm. um, do you have anything to say about those? No. How no. Yeah. Yeah, nothing, nothing that I've seen. Um, this isn't really even from my area. This is, you know, Dena'ina, Dena'ina. I'm an Atna person. Uh, and the sort of red ochre that we would have would be along the sleeves, uh, along the seams of our regalia, and then also um, along the chest and along the, the pointed edge of our regalia. So this was something that was very um, particular to Dena'ina people. 
mm. having the the caribou depicted thank you or at least what we know of thanks yeah i also love the really old beads yeah well, we haven't seen two beads like this and then it seems like they have flat edges that they're not rounded yeah they so the longer two beads have um they have like little ridges so slightly flattened edges uh, let's see if i can I actually can't see where i'm showing you guys so <laughs> let me know no no they're showing up really nicely okay great yeah they're really beautiful i know it's almost like looking at morse code yeah cool. yeah just like imagine me living in Santa Fe, feeling very homesick, and then going to the Coast Center and seeing something that I'd only seen at a museum, you know, behind glass of like the of of um, my relatives and the people who I grew up around, you know, um, in in Kenai. So seeing that um, is is really important. And that that book too that uh, that America had put it in the chat or in the chat. Uh, Aaron Leggett had written um, an essay on you know Tanina or Dina or Danina, you know, and talking about that change, you know, and uh, we see that in the record that it's written down is so. I think that's what's special about doing stuff like this um, with artists and with indigenous peoples that we can add to that record, you know, and correct information in from, you know, from from us as primary sources and then also um, so we can access it, you know, so we can search these databases and find ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Speaking of the record, um, the record on that one said that the uh, the small triangles might have referenced skin lodges or teepees. Does that ring true at all, or um, maybe maybe skin lodges? Denina people didn't really, you know, we we'd have we would they they would have subterranean homes, so mm -hmm. homes that were kind of into the ground, but it wasn't like a structure like this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that, but but I. Uh, yeah, I think that's definitely one of those things. Thanks, America, actually, for bringing that up, because it is. It's like we have records that are wonderful, but often have a lot of ambiguity or mistakes or things that have just evolved over the years. And so it is. It's so great to be able to have them continue to evolve by having touching base with artists and elders and community members. Absolutely. So, yeah, I was curious your take on the triangles. Cause that always seemed a little well like there would be sezels which are um which are like uh, steam 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 houses that would maybe come to a point but from from uh what i've seen elders do for for those and then also for like little shelters is that you would use willow and you would just you would just bend the willow and tie them off over sort of like your your sort of dugout sort of hole and then you would put hides over that. So it would never really come to a point like that, you know, um, as, as I would imagine. So it never did in what I experienced or witnessed. Thanks. Okay. This one's a little bit trickier for me to handle, but we will bring it up. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Somebody is at my door. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> okay. Yeah, so this is a, a really special piece. Um, so this is a puberty necklace. Uh, so at, at the time of uh, a woman's um, puberty, um, her first puberty, she would be gifted this, a necklace like this. Um, and sorry, I'm trying to open my door. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so I, I, I forget what I was saying. Oh, so this was, so this is a puberty necklace. So this would be given to, um, a young woman at her first period and she would, uh, be given this. It would be created by, um, uh, a, a man in her family for her and she would have it the rest of her life. So the bone piece in there is actually a swan wing bone. 
and it's used because it is a hollow bone and that's what she would use to drink water. So women in Dene culture, uh, certainly in, in um, Atna and Dene'ina, Dene'ina culture, are considered very powerful beings and so powerful that you could change the um, luck. You could, you could change the whole luck of an entire village, you know, so if you were to, you know, during your, during your period, you were the most powerful. So if you were to touch the water, or if you were to step over a man's um, shoes, uh, or hunting uh, implement, or, or tools, you could change his whole luck. And you would uh, basically kind of signal out to the, to the animals that uh, not, to, not to choose that person. So um, part of, uh, you know, what I, the sort of, potlatch part of of all these objects is that you know you all, all these things only came to you and you were only given the materials created from them if you were a good person and part of being a good person as a woman was being aware of the power that you had and protecting others from that um, but then also taking care of for your own health so um, a young woman would go into seclusion during her first sort of uh, menstrual cycle for about a month and she would be in her own sort of like tent and uh, she would use this necklace and these tools on there to work and to, um, to be very careful not to touch her body or scratch her body because you could, you could change the balance of things and you didn't want to release um, that, that power. Uh, women were also, um, in my culture, uh, while women would prepare food, they would never serve food, um, you know, and during your, during, during your cycle, that, that was a big sort of ingi thing, taboo thing to do. Uh, so you would use this tool, like this necklace, to protect people from that. You know, you would be holding it not only to kind of signal to everyone else, but also to also to protect people from, or I guess not from you, but I think to sort of make people aware, you know, of who you are and to kind of remind you of that. Um, so this is, you know, obviously created with some beautiful trade beads um, and cancona, you know, our dentalium, which is a, a really important um, part of Dene sort of regalia. And more than just regalia, um, cancona, the dentalium, the sort of like tusk-like shell, was a symbol of responsibility and wealth. And wealth in Diné culture is, uh, really equates to what other people think of you. So you would get cancona, you'd get dentalium during potlatches, during ceremonies, um, and you were given, gifted these things if you were a good person and if you were a leader. And you would in turn, you know, give those to others. So in potlatch, um, I won't go into every detail of it, but it's a time, you know, during a significant moment of life, whether it's a birth or a death, and the opposite clans gives all their wealth to people. Okay, thank you, Elaine. Um, Elaine put some information on the uh, on, in the chat, but uh, so during potlatch, potlatch, um, your the opposite clans would uh, give their wealth to the clan that was. Uh, the clan that was opposite of them. So if somebody, if someone in my clan was born or if somebody passed away in my clan, we would give all of our wealth to the opposite clan. So even though we were in mourning or even though that we were celebrating, we'd always be gifting to the opposites. And you did that because it would create allegiances amongst clans, but it would also create this sort of reciprocal society of, of always paying your power, your wealth, respect to others. And it was sort of this act of faith because you would do this and then you hope in their time of grief or in their time of birth that um, they would give it back to you. And it created a really kind of beautiful circle. And then also, there's also this, I think, um, way of being with Potlatch that uh, everything that you have is sort of temporal. 
you know, and everything that you're given or created that's been created is it lives with you for a time and then it's going to move on into another life. And, you know, the, um, the puberty necklace was one of those things, you know, it was one of those heirlooms that would be passed down. Um, so my elder Helen Dick uh, had one of these necklaces and she's the, um, the, the youngest person that I know who's had one and she's in her uh, late seventies right now, or maybe mid seventies more like, and uh, she told me about, you know, her grandpa, you know, making her a necklace like this and basically going into seclusion and uh, her grandma, she was raised by her grandparents, um, would, would basically, um, teach her about what it was, what it meant to be like a woman and an adult and how it is that you cared for your family and what sort of things you shouldn't do. And it was all kind of like surrounded around this ceremony, you know, of this necklace. You know, this is like a very special object because I think it, it not only um, represents these long traditions, I think it represents uh, the role of of women in matriarchal societies, you know, with Dene people, you know, that it's around um, the power and the deep respect that women were were given and uh, experienced in life. They were considered powerful beings, and you had to be careful with that, and you had to take care of yourself. So yeah, so I, I really love this piece. Uh, not only for its like trade beads and the dentalium, but also because of what it symbolizes and what it means, you know, and then also the, the stories that um, Helen shared with me, uh, you know, as, as my elder and relative. So, yeah. Oops, America, you're on mute again. Sorry, this is not my day. But can you speak to the shape of the carved bone and the ridges at all? So that's a comb. Okay, so, okay. yeah, so the comb on there. Uh, so what Helen told me is that you had to be really careful because you were so powerful that if you were to scratch yourself or if you were to like create a wound that you or, you know, that you that you could actually like unleash like spiritual power, you know, and and that imbalance of things was not good for anyone. It was not good for the land. It was not good for the community, you know, and it was not good for the animals. So these tools were basically meant to remind you, you know, of, of like the power that you held in your hands and to use those things rather than like your fingers. <laughs> and there's a little awl as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so Helen told me during these times, you would just basically sit in your tent and you would just sew constantly and you would just be learning all those things you know that i uh, you know that a young woman you know in in the community those sort of roles that she needed to learn and is there anything or could you speak to the juxtaposition of the red colors and the blue colors in the beads i mean like so these the blue and reds are um, definitely very important colors in my area. Uh, but I, I also think too that it's it's not necessarily, uh, like I've seen different puberty necklaces with different colors. Yeah, so, so it's not- So it's aesthetic choices? Yeah, yeah. I've also seen puberty necklaces with like thimbles, metal thimbles attached to them, yeah. you know, post contact things um, with coins attached to them, you know, uh, Dene people have a long tradition of, of marking time with kind of like tiny objects, you know, and counting cords, you know, is that you would, you would basically, um, that's what my aunts say are like the traditional calendars is your counting cord, right? And you would, you would count the days and then if something good happened on that day or something you needed to remember for that month, you'd put like, you, you'd put a little piece of metal on there, you know, or you would sew like a, a, um, a button onto it you know, and, and I think in some ways this is kind of replicating that, you know, that these little implements and objects are, are reminders, um, but then of course also utilitarian tools with sewing. And then has there been any investigation on what the cordage is? So it's a native, is it a native plant? Um, oh, just this right here, this cordage, or that's connected, the connecting fiber? So I think there's sinew. 
that's on here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is, yeah, it's fiber that's not sinew on that, and I don't know what the cordage is. I think they're contact. Those look like linen. Even that sinew kind of looks a little thick to me. You think? Yeah. Yeah, but but it's hard to tell. Yeah, and you know you can see obviously this is just a little uh, sort of binding fabric that was connected much later, obviously to keep the the necklace together. Well, and this is also something that would be considered an heirloom, so it would be passed down between women, you know, and so it, it probably needed to be repaired over the years and then also probably redecorated over the years as well. Melissa, I just want to say thank you. It's powerful being able to hold this piece while you tell this story. Really appreciate it. I really love that piece. Uh, I did a few art pieces about that piece. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. <laughs> but uh, I think that um, for me, like this really represents uh, that kind of potlatch way of being, which is like always giving your wealth away, you know, and really kind of realizing that um, things that live with you are temporal. And, you know, these objects come into your life, you know, via the land and animals, and you, you honor that gift by by passing it along um and sharing those things you know so this is created with a swan you know so a kagos you know uh we've had caribou on here a uh, uh, you know animal moose dinigi and uh, porcupine you know nuni which is yeah so cool mm -hmm. Were you going to be able to share any of your artwork with us or? Sure. So I have just a few pictures. Um, so let me go ahead and I'll share that. Or can I? You oh. should be able to now. Okay. Oh, there it is. I was like, where is the button? Okay. So um, come on. is it shared? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. Uh, so I do a lot of different things and uh, I'll try not to go too long over my time. Um, but uh, I, you know, I, I said, you know, that I am a curator and an artist. Um, but really, I, I think that I, I feel like I am just a person who is trying to frame um, these ideas that I've learned, you know, potlatch and community and, um, you know, living off the land in in every aspect of that you know um so i create a lot of work um, and do a lot of curation that is based in those kind of things um that in order for me to work within institutions to work um in galleries you know in in art i need to sort of recognize whatever power and privilege that i've been given um, and look at that as a responsibility to give it away, to find ways to share those things and to find ways to uh, to uplift others, you know. Um, so I, I've done a lot of work, uh, you know, in, in institutions, um, but also independently, um, finding different ways to, to curate um, contemporary indigenous art from, from the perspective of letting the letting the letting the whole goal of whatever project whatever exhibit be directed by people you know i think in alaska um something that we're really used to uh in, in the north in general is a lot of people come to us with a lot of ideas on on what would make a great exhibition what would be a great art project what would be you know something that would really lift up our community without first asking what we want you know first asking in what ways they can support us and so for me in my art practice i always try to start there start with the introduction you know with telling people who i am with telling them what my intentions are and and asking them you know to to tell me who they are to tell me what is important to them you know and i think that that's shaped a lot of what i do and uh 
and and certainly has been shaped with how I approach connect collections and you know have been any sort done any sort of work with them. Um, so these are just some images I I'm currently curating at APU. I'm working on an exhibit with uh, Susie Jones and Laura Addison who are in the call right now um, with the Santa Fe Folk Art Museum. Um, and in hopefully maybe working with the co again as well. But I, uh, yeah, so I think the work that I do is all based around that. I also do uh, a lot of work with the trying to trying to think about the intersection between um, physical art making and also um, facilitated discussion. Uh, for whatever reason, I've always been kind of put into a teaching role, an education role with whatever sort of thing that I do. And it, it seems to be kind of a natural thing. Um, you know, my, my native name means little teacher. And, uh, you know, I so I've been doing a, a lot of work on land acknowledgements and, you know, performative allyship and how we can avoid doing things that are just buzzworthy you know so we can do things that have a little bit more depth to them and is actually holding us accountable to um holding institutions accountable to to the 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 things that they benefit from which in many museums is is indigenous cultures indigenous people indigenous work and how it is that we can we can provide um we can equitably equitably provide um I think uh, moments where where we're able to give back to each other, you know. Uh, so this is a project I did, a photo essay I did uh, down in Homer with Benell Street Art Center. So we were talking about land acknowledgments, um, but then also creating land acknowledgments that were based in some sort of action. So uh, with the community, we ended up making all these signs um, that, uh, and then we went to the local uh, tribes, um, <laughs> my family essentially, and, you know, asked them sort of like permission, you know, to put these on the land, you know, and, and sort of like giving, giving back sort of ownership to, to recognizing people um, in, on the land, you know, in public spaces, um, and then also being a little civilly disobedient and we, we ended up like installing these signs and just sort of like bolting them to public gazebos <laughs> and different <laughs> things around Homer. Um, but uh, it ended up being a really positive response. Uh, we had like a lot of people, um, you know, go to city council and say, let's just leave these up for as long as they live, you know, and uh, it was something that was really created in community um, with elders and uh, with, with, uh, you know, the indigenous community to recognize, you know, their long standing stewardship in a place and, uh, and to do so in their language, um, you know, with with people who were looking to, to find moments where they could be allies and so they did it through work and they did it through uh through a lot of um humbleness so this was a, a really nice project we did i've been doing these uh trainings on uh, on land acknowledgement and how it can it can go beyond um just the words because it truly land acknowledgements is just words and it's becoming more and more commonplace in alaska you know and uh I think that we're in danger of of doing something that uh, that is actually harmful and uh, and not a positive thing if we don't do it with a lot of work and a lot of personal in investment uh, as part of that. So uh, I also do a lot of uh, language work stuff. So um, I uh, am current. I'm, I'm by, part of a new media collective. Um, in Alaska that has actually just started. We, we got our second round of funding, um, but we basically are publishing comics and new media and educational resources uh, from the perspective that in order to give the, the best story, in order to give the most transparent, authentic story, all of our stories need to be created by community and by elders um, and by by a collective of people. So um, it's myself, Nathan Schaefer, Demi Manchuris, and Richard Perry. And uh, 
they're all called sort of comet guys. <laughs> and then I'm more of a, um, a zine person, but uh, I've been creating uh, educational resources um, that are drawn uh, talking about language and talking about uh, basically stories from Chikulun from um, where I'm from and uh, those personal sort of things. But uh, yeah, that's kind of my current work right now, which is uh, creating creating little books on, on, I think this intersection between things that we need to talk about and things that we need to make, you know, and, and using that intersection and that conversation as a way to decolonize and a way to sort of reimagine like what a, what a future can look like, you know, in Alaska, in our communities um, that is based in equity and based in, uh, believing native people and i uh, i think that that that's i feel like that's a needed thing um from my experiences within institutions so could you I, share the name of your collective it's called shared universe um we're actually going to have a, a discussion let's see i wonder if i can find it um so in uh in uh, at the Bunnell Street Art Center. Um, maybe I'll just drop that in the chat. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, Bunnell Street Art Center. Um, this Friday, we're gonna have a discussion about uh, the the new work that we're creating right now. Um, and it'll be at, a, at 11 a.m. Uh, Alaska Standard Time um, through the Bunnell Street Art Center Zoom. They, it's a series called Inspiration and Adaptation. Uh, and yeah, we're going to be starting the Shared Universe Book Club, <laughs> which is um, looking at the media created and uh, trying to get our readership's feedback on that um, so we can learn how to move forward, you know. And I think the pieces that we're going to look at are Demi uh, Mincheris' work, who is a cousin of mine from Chickaloon, um, and then also uh, Nathan Schaefer who uh, is creating a Danina sort of like a trilogy called Winter Mood. Um, and it's all based on sort of like uh, Danina knowledge um, from a young uh, Danina woman uh, who is neurodivergent and uh, uh, has special powers that are based in, you know, potlatch and all these belief systems, which is really beautiful. Um, but yeah, that's what I do. and. I do a lot of different things, so it's hard to kind of narrow it down, but I, I really just try to uh, do things based on those potlatch values, which is, you know, being a good person and knowing that whatever, whatever things I receive, it's only with me for a few, for a finite amount of time and that I need to find ways to give it away and to share that wealth and um, power, so. Well, we have a little bit of time left um, if you're willing to take questions. Sure. Okay, how do we 86 the screen share? Oh, I think maybe I have to stop. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, um, I can unmute people if we trust you. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't trust myself. And you can always, uh, you can always uh, text it too. I know we have questions. Well, what are you gonna do in Sweden? Sorry. Oh yeah. So um, I, I recently, well, not recently. Uh, I was supposed to this summer actually go to Sweden for um, an artist residency, uh, but that was postponed because of the pandemic. Um, but what we're what we're planning now to do is so we're we're very similar latitudes in Anchorage and in Skovde. And so we're going to try to do uh, something that's that's about sort of like about land and about like creating materials from land, uh, uh, very in a similar way that I do in Alaska, um, and using that to sort of like frame conversations. So a lot of my art practice is turned into conversations and it turned into this kind of decolonizing work of of really just trying to understand each other. Um, they're a very diverse community. Uh, they were a sanctuary city, so they have a, a very diverse population. And, you know, from, 
from what the research I've been doing, trying to be a good guest, you know, in their home is, is learning about like these very complex systems of, co of colonization in Sweden. And so we're going to try to have some conversations with that um, while we're making art together, you know, and uh, yeah, so <laughs> we'll see. In a way, we're just going to be trying to get to know each other all summer, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, I think uh, a way to be a good guest. So, yeah, I'm going to be there for a couple months and uh, it'll end in a, a small exhibit of hopefully collaborative um, work that we do in the community. And uh, yeah, yes, yeah, so that's what I'll be doing there. Um, I also uh, recently got the Jenny House uh, Artist Residency um, in Whitehorse. Uh, it will be a virtual residency. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to be doing something called Cold Conversations. And so I'm going to be working with, I was hoping to work with artists in, in Whitehorse, but I think we're going to do is uh, do it as if do it as if I was in Whitehorse, but within my own community, and then hopefully have something similar happen in Whitehorse down the line. So while we're outside and, you know, can't like be inside and gather, we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna like sit around a fire and have have discussions about art practice making and uh, how, how we make in the north and how it's uh, can be like a very unique sort of experience experience for artists. And then I'm going to be collecting those and sharing them through different zines and different like small publications. Cool. Are there any other questions? There's some nice comments in the chat, Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> it's really nice to see people I know <laughs> in here. All oh, Hollis and Eben. <laughs> well, Melissa, we miss miss having you visit us. I have to say, I look forward to when when you can travel this way again. Yeah, I hope so. Hopefully, hopefully next Indian market, I can come visit and have a reunion with everyone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that was probably the last time I saw you, America, was indian market so it's probably spazzed out and <laughs> no recollection <laughs> oh, God. maybe gosh 2018 or 17 maybe it's a while ago <laughs> well, it's, it's uh great to see how much you've done since you graduated like and we're a student here i think that's when i first met you was when you were a student and it's so cool to see you like doing this community involvement and being so um, knowledgeable, knowledgeable about all this stuff. Like, it's just awesome to see. And so I really enjoyed this presentation. Love seeing the work. Uh, it's amazing to see what was in the codes collection. Like, I love that tufting stuff too. Um, just beautiful. And it's just great to see like you're doing so well with this. Thank you. It's good to hear from you. Yeah, it's it's been kind of a whirlwind since since after I I got home and I uh, yeah I think that I for a while I I had I had tried to sort of be an artist you know before I went to I I um, but it really wasn't till after that I think that I gained sort of the confidence to to feel like I had a place in within institutions within the art world within anything and. Uh, I don't know. There's something about like that power of belief and just sort of faking it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's all, it's all been working out, you know, and now, and now I'm curating with Susie Jones, who's in the oh, here. <laughs> <laughs> pretty amazing. So. I have a question, Melissa. Can mm -hmm. anyone join the book club? Yeah. So it's, uh, yep. Anyone can join the book club. Um, it'll be the first one will be Friday. So we're just going to be kind of talking about who we are and how we're trying to kind of like gather qualitative data on these stories. Because um, we're really looking at like at modern sort of like new media comic book storytelling, but from more of an oral tradition perspective, which one is which is which is gathered and created in community. 
Uh, so trying to do the same with with our publications, you know, of course, it's, it's a bit more difficult because it's not, we can't like change the story like that, but we can, but we can adjust how it is that we write about it and talk about it. And so we're hoping that people can give us feedback on those things. So thank you, America. Yeah, yeah, America put it on there. Uh, but so Benel Street Art Center, feel free to drop in when you can. Cool. And we're actually organized enough that we know our next speaker. <laughs> so Kelly Church chopped down a bunch of trees on her property. <laughs> so she has internet now. <laughs> Which I'm really excited about. But, so um, yeah, we will do this again um, Tuesday, October 20th. And Kelly Church, who's Ottawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi from Michigan, she'll be discussing different, um, different Anishinaabe uh, artworks in the co-collection. Yay. Yay. So I think that's us out. Yeah. So much for spending this time with us. Yeah. Chanan, everyone. <laughs>